Well, first reading today, we got to hear from the book of Job. The book of Job is one of my three favorite books in the Bible. In case you're curious, the other two are the Gospel of Mark and Revelation. Is there anybody in here who has those same three favorites? <laughs> I never get a raised hand when I say that. But here's why I like the book of Job. Because the book of Job asks a question and then turns it completely on its ear at the end. And it asks the same question that many of us ask ourselves every day. When Book of Job was written, people believed that if they were good, then they were rewarded by God. If they were bad, they were punished by God. Is that something maybe some of us have heard about these days? Yes. The story stands in complete opposition to that theology. So those who have dealt with tremendous loss and grief and who are living in fear, we can find tremendous comfort in this story if we know how to look for it. Now, our lectionary cycle only gives us little snippets from this book. And so today, I want to talk about the story that leads up to God's proclamation that we just heard a moment ago. The story begins with Job, who is described as a good and righteous man. We know he's a good and righteous man. Job does too. Yet he has lost everything that matters to him. Folks come by and they tell him he should just give up on God, give up on goodness, since God either, do, either doesn't care or doesn't exist. But even as he sits in an ash pit covered in sores, Job does not curse God. Rather, he sits in silence with his pain. And three of his friends come to be with him. And they come and they sit silently with him without trying to make him feel better. Somehow they're wise enough to know he just needs to know he's not alone. They are so wise for seven days. And on the seventh day, Job's pain bursts out of him and he begins talking about all the awful things that have happened. And his friends, they're not able to just listen. They can't stand it. So they start talking. They use the language of the theology that all of them have shared. They talk of an ordered universe where tragedy is caused by God because of human sin. Now, Job knows he's done nothing to deserve his tragedies, but his friends know that bad things do not happen to good people. So they try to help him discover exactly what awful thing he has done. Job reiterates his innocence and even at this point continues to praise God. He says, for I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, then in my flesh, I shall see God, whom I shall see with my own eyes. But his friends kind of ignore that. And with increasingly annoying arguments, they keep bothering him again and again. And Job keeps telling them he's done nothing wrong. Finally, Job just gets sick of them. And he's, they're not helpful. So what he decides is he's going to call on God. He's going to call on God, tell God to show up, and tell Job why these awful things have happened. In that moment, God tells, Job tells God exactly what he thinks about him. Has anybody ever heard of the patience of Job? Yeah, they're not very patient. He tells the God of justice that God has been unjust, that Job has held up his end of the bargain. He's a good and righteous man. So God owes him an explanation for why these awful things have happened. And Job hasn't lost his faith, even as he makes his demands. He trusts that God is there and that God will hear him. Job delivers his full argument, and then he sits in silence once again. Silently, he waits for God to show up. And finally, God does show up. God appears in a whirlwind like a tornado and speaks to Job. And for several chapters, God speaks to Job. And in all that time, God does not answer Job's accusations. Nor does God give an answer to that original question, why do bad things happen to good people? Rather, God's speech is full of the kinds of things we heard just a few moments ago. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who laid this cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? God's speech continues with these kinds of questions. And frankly, if you read them one way, they sound really snarky. They say that God wants Job to feel insignificant. You will probably hear sermons or read things about people who believe that that is what God is trying to do. 
but I don't see it that way. I hear God telling Job about all the wonders of creation, creation that is bigger and wilder than anything Job could know or imagine. God speaks of making it rain in the wilderness even if no one is there to see it. God speaks of mountain goats and wild oxen, the ostrich, horses, hawks, eagles. God talks about behemoth, a great land monster, and leviathan, a great sea monster, things that would terrify human beings, and God just kind of made them for fun. God talks about all of creation, and he says, yes, it's beautiful, and it's chaotic. It's a creation filled with things that cannot be controlled. Creation is neither ordered nor predictable. And God is not some sober and righteous God who punishes and rewards and tells things exactly what to do. No, God finds joy in the unpredictable nature of creation. God is delighted by it. Voltaire once said that God is a comedian playing to an audience that is afraid to laugh. God is a comedian playing to an audience that's afraid to laugh. That is the God that appeared to Job in the whirlwind shared with him all the wonders that Job will never see, showing him that while he will never understand God or how the world works, God understands how the world works. God does not delight in the world's suffering, in our suffering, and nor does he cause it. We live in the world that God created and that human beings have helped to build. And we can neither understand nor can we control most of what happens in our lives. Some of those things are so delightful, and some are absolutely dreadful. And the book of Job, while it starts out with that why question, actually ends up going in a completely different direction, one that is helpful to us today. Because the story is about human pain, and in the midst of the deepest pain imaginable, Job teaches us how to live in faith, trust. Instead of turning his back on God, Job shouts his pain and his anger to the heavens, and God showed up. The creator of all the worlds, the creatures, the stars, the storms, that God cared enough about Job that when Job called, God came. Now, God didn't come in the way Job wanted. God didn't answer the question that Job wanted answered. And that is how God comes to us when we call. Like what happens to Job, God rarely comes to us when and how we want. We want answers to questions that may have no answer. We want God to show up and fix things right now. Job reminds us we may never get that answer. And we too, like Job, may have to wait a long time to know God's presence. So what we can do is make the decision to trust God. Faith is nothing in our head. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is a decision to trust that God is in charge of the world. Day after day to trust that God is with us, even when it seems that God is deaf to our prayers. At the end of God's speech, Job says, I know you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be opposed successfully. And I have indeed spoken about things I didn't understand. There are wonders beyond my comprehension. My ears had heard about you. But now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I can find comfort even in dust and ashes. Therefore, I can find comfort even in dust and ashes. May we too have the courage to wait for God's answer. May we too have the courage to live in trust and know that God is ultimately in charge of this world. And may we too have the courage and the trust to pray and proclaim with Job, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the end he will stand upon the earth, and in my flesh I shall see God. And let the people say, Amen. Amen.